Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ in Freebie Friday. Now before we begin, if you're new to our channel, first and foremost, welcome, we're happy to have you. Now these videos are all about answering your health related questions. So what occurs is you have a question concerning your health, perhaps something regarding nutrition, diet, supplementation, herbalism, Chinese medicine, or really anything regarding your health and wellness or perhaps somebody else's. And if you would like our help answering those questions, all you need to do is leave them in the comment section below. And then we go back and peruse the various comments in the comment sections of these videos. And then we select the questions to answer in which we are first and foremost capable of answering the questions that we feel are going to be the most beneficial to the group overall. And usually questions that are infrequent or unique questions we haven't answered before. So something else really great about these videos is that every week from that comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms. And you don't need a health question to be entered to win. If you'd like to win some free herbs or mushrooms and you don't have a question for us this week, all you have to do is make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You give this video a thumbs up and then just drop any comment in the comment section below. And with all that being said, let's get to this week's questions. So getting to our first question, this question reads, what plastics should men avoid to avoid estrogen, which would therefore lower testosterone? So that's a really good question. I talk a lot about the toxic and stressful effects of estrogen here on the YouTube channel and how our modern environment, the various plastics as mentioned, the various phytoestrogens, other xenoestrogens, so estrogen mimicking substances in our environment that tend to accumulate in not just the food, but in our water supply. They can even be in our air supply, and they are largely concentrated in various commercial industrial products that we tend to come into contact with on a daily, regular basis. So other than just the plastics, another major source of estrogen mimicking substances or endocrine disrupting substances are various personal care products. So like cosmetics, shampoos, conditioners, various body cleansers and facial lotions and serums. Uh, deodorants are a major source of these endocrine disruptors, not to mention a lot of household cleaning products, our carpets, our cabinets, and a lot of the materials that our modern houses are made up of can contain these estrogen mimicking substances and have toxic effects in the body. And as I've talked about in various videos, estrogen does mimic the stress response in the body. The major negative impact that it has on your health is first and foremost, estrogen tends to disrupt cellular metabolism. So it steals oxygen from the mitochondria and oxygen is the backbone, the bottleneck for oxidative phosphorylation meaning that without oxygen, you can't efficiently convert any of the substrates, fat, protein, or carb into ATP or energy. So it leads to this oxygen deprived state that can interfere with energy production and therefore inflict a stress in the cell. So just like if you were to be starved of or deprived of oxygen, you'd go into a hyperventilating like state, which is very characteristic of a stress state. So oftentimes when you're stressed out, one of the first things you tend to do is hyperventilate. So whether this is from aerobic exercise, getting scared, or just going into a sort of panic or anxiety, hyperventilation or the lack of oxygen is a basic stress and oxygen can induce this cellular stress again by stealing the oxygen from the powerhouse of your cell. And beyond that, estrogen does actually stimulate the adrenal pituitary stress system. So estrogen can actually stimulate and act on the adrenal glands by way of the pituitary gland, causing the adrenal glands to overproduce various adrenal steroids like cortisol primarily, adrenaline and aldosterone, and it can even stimulate the overproduction of DHEA, as I've talked about in a recent video, and that excess DHEA, especially under the influence of high estrogen, can turn into more estrogen, creating a vicious hormonal imbalance. And aside from those primary things, estrogen is actually known to activate retroviruses in the body. So high amounts of environmental estrogens may be the major contributing factor to the increased rise of autoimmunity. As I've talked about in other videos, estrogen is a major contributing factor to the wasting condition that you see in autoimmunity. And as this person mentioned in particular, estrogen does tend to oppose the production of a lot of the various androgens in the body. It sort of directly competes with testosterone. And ideally you wanna have at least, I would say a two to one ratio 
of testosterone to estrogen, if not about 50 to 100 times more testosterone to estrogen in the body. And getting back to the question, one of the simplest ways and also a very effective way to avoid this estrogen dominance and balance where you have more estrogen to androgens like testosterone would be to avoid a lot of the plastics that you see in our modern environment. And from my understanding, the most estrogenic plastics are the ones that contain BPA, which is most abundantly found in polycarbonate plastics, in plastics, or any product that contains an epoxy resin. So not only are plastic bottles in various plastic containers, you know, common examples of the BPA rich plastics are the ones that you find usually in the grocery store that holds and contains things like commercial milk and commercial juices, a lot of soda, a lot of the industrial produced foods that are typically junk food. So that's an easy way to avoid the BPA plastics is usually low quality food products are what are contained in them. So all sorts of various snack like foods are gonna likely be held within uh, polycarbonate plastics because it's incredibly cheap and very easy to manufacture at, at a, an incredibly mass amount or to mass produce them in other words. But also keep in mind that epoxy resin contains BPA and epoxy resin is underneath the caps of a lot of bottle caps like in various juices and pop. It's that little plastic piece under the plastic lid, usually on plastic bottles. You can find epoxy resin actually on the inside of most canned foods. So BPA free cans is gonna be something else to look for if you're consuming any sort of canned food. And of course, if you're somebody that has any sorts of arts and crafts or if you're handling any sort of industrial products that contain epoxy in of itself, or if you're using epoxy, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're not breathing that stuff in and getting it on your skin. Also, avoid heat. If you have any sort of food product contained in plastic, the last thing you're ever gonna to wanna to do is heat it up. And this is a mistake that actually a lot of people make, especially people in the fitness industry that store their food in Ziploc bags and Tupperware, and then they heat up that meal prep food in their Tupperware in the microwave. Not only is most Tupperware gonna contain BPA and other estrogenic plastic uh, chemical substances in it, but heating it up is gonna actually melt down somewhat. It's going to free up the various estrogens in them and cause it to leach into the food, making it even worse. So if you have any plastic in your life, the basic thing is to never mix the heat and the plastic together. That's a very awful combination. But in an ideal world, I would just avoid plastic altogether. It's actually a lot easier than you think it is. In terms of food storage, just stick to glass Tupperware. They're pricier, but they're gonna last a long time. And there's a lot of plus sides to them. They're easier to clean. They're highly more aesthetic. They're more durable. There's a lot of plus sides to getting the glass. And then you just reuse and recycle them as opposed to you know just grabbing a new Tupperware every time and being lazy, in other words. So I'd stick to glass. Then in regards to cooking utensils and the various dishware you might serve your food on, also just stick to glass. Use wood cooking utensils when possible. Most metals are pretty safe, especially stainless steel and copper. And then you could use occasional cast iron or glass cookware, and again, even glass plates, cups, etc. So the basic idea is to just avoid plastic altogether, because again, even some of the BPA-free plastics might have estrogenic substances in them, so you're better off just avoiding all of them, to be honest. And it's actually easier than you might think, although it's typically all around us, the average modern person has plastic in every corner of their life. You know, they're storing all of their personal care products in plastic bottles, they're storing their food in it, there's plastic in a lot of their clothes and their household, and then of course they're getting the plastics in their cleaning products and perhaps breathing them in. But there's very simple things that you can do, and honestly, what I've come to find is it's actually incredibly easier and more efficient to avoid plastics because, for example, you don't need 20 cleaning products to clean your house. A basic solution of vinegar and baking soda will deodorize and kill anything as efficiently, if not more efficiently, and in a way that's significantly less toxic than the 20 cleaning products that most people have in their homes. You don't need a different cleaning product for every surface of your house. It's just not feasible. It's just not logical, and it's just an easy way to sell people with more products. Again, just in terms of cleaning products, just stick to a basic solution of baking soda and vinegar, and then just store it in your own glass container. You know, you can get a glass jug, or you can just mix it up in a big bowl and use it with a sponge. So I actually think it's more economical and even efficient over time to avoid the use of various plastics and just get more simple and more minimal in your lifestyle. So I think, again, the simplest way to go about it would be to avoid all plastics 
And then from there, you know, if you run into a situation where, you know, you buy some fresh orange juice as I do, and it comes in a plastic container, that's not necessarily gonna kill you. What really has the negative effect in the body is being exposed to plastic all around you at every angle of your life over an entire lifespan. So it's the acute and then chronic accumulation of the plastics over time. And again, it's very easy to just minimize them and basically stick to glass. And this is gonna involve obviously, you know, doing some of your own cooking more so and just getting more control of the products you use and simplifying your life. So hopefully that helps you to understand. I think the simple way I look at it after refining my understanding of the various estrogenic plastics is again, to just stick to making your own stuff you know, so in regards to uh, going out to eat and all those things, you know, if you minimize that, just get rid of that expense, cook your own stuff, you're going to be in control of what sort of plastics your food's exposed to. So, you know, doing some of your own cooking or more of your own cooking. Again, when it comes to personal care products and household cleaning products, you don't need five personal care products. You can wash your body and wash your hair with something simple as a Castile soap. And you can also clean your whole house with one solution. So, I think it's just about simplifying your life and just asking yourself, you know, at the end of the day, is this something that's truly natural? Do I truly need it or is it just another novelty like product? So I think it just comes back to simplifying things. Hopefully this answers your question. Again, the BPAs are the most estrogenic from what I know, but a lot of the other plastics still have some sort of estrogenic quality and you're better off just sticking to glass, wood, bamboo, uh, stainless steel and other actual natural products. All right, so getting to our second question, this question reads, what are the best ways to treat high iron due to genetic factors? So I actually have an entire video on my personal YouTube channel that you can see here that talks about the toxicity of iron in the body, how iron accumulates, the various negative effects it can have in the body, and the true causes of things like anemia. So generally speaking, iron accumulates in the tissues as we age. And because it's a very reactive heavy metal, when it does start to accumulate in the body, it can first and foremost cause mineral imbalances. And because it's very reactive, one of the first things it tends to destroy in the body is vitamin E. And vitamin E is actually essential for protecting the red blood cells and the various cells in the body from oxidizing or experiencing oxidative damage. So usually because iron destroys vitamin E, iron is going to therefore increase the cell susceptibility to lipid peroxidation, which can damage the red blood cells, making them so fragile that they are rapidly breaking down at a rate significantly higher than they are being produced. So this is usually what causes a low red blood cell count. It's not low iron, it's actually usually high iron and a deficiency of vitamin E. So usually when people are anemic or they have a low red blood cell count, it's because they actually have a deficiency of vitamin E, which is highly protective to your red blood cells and prevents the rapid breakdown of red blood cells. So in regards to high iron levels, this is just something that most people have, especially if they're elderly people or if they're a female, they're likely having uh, problems with their menstrual cycle. So they're perhaps missing a cycle or a period. So they're not bleeding as regularly as they should. And this would cause an accumulation of iron for women, but men tend to accumulate iron more so, and it has more toxic effects in the male body because it tends to accumulate higher because men obviously are not bleeding every single month. But the reason that women tend to be more anemic than men, although men accumulate more iron, isn't because iron is actually protective against anemia is because women tend to be more lower thyroid and have more estrogen and the combination of low thyroid and estrogen can actually contribute to the accumulation of iron in the body and anemia because keep in mind estrogen opposes thyroid function and the thyroid is responsible for the proper oxidation of glucose which therefore puts out carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide in other words is the byproduct of glucose oxidation driven by the thyroid function. And it's actually carbon dioxide that detaches oxygen from the hemoglobin, freeing up oxygen to be used cellularly, which would also make iron more freely available for cellular use. So it's usually low thyroid, low carbon dioxide, which impairs the proper utilization of oxygen in the cells. And that can have a negative effect on your iron levels and cause iron to accumulate in the tissues. And this also brings into play copper. Not only does copper tend to regulate iron in the body, you want a balance of copper to iron in the body, preferably more copper than you do iron, but copper also maintains the integrity and the elasticity of the red blood cells. 
and it's very, very crucial for ensuring the proper cellular utilization of oxygen. So it's an essential part of the electron transport chain where oxygen is taken into the cell. So a copper deficiency is usually one of the major reasons for an iron imbalance. And again, usually the saturation of iron in the tissues that is damaging the red blood cells, destroying vitamin E, and causing a lot of the symptoms of anemia by basically, again, breaking down the red blood cell and significantly decreasing the integrity of the red blood cell. So the basic things you're gonna wanna do is take a look at thyroid function, estrogen levels, vitamin E, and copper. So because you're a female, it's probable you have higher levels of estrogen than you probably should have. This is impairing thyroid function. And combined, this is going to lead to a decreased production of carbon dioxide, which could cause issues with oxygen getting into the cell and causing it to bind with iron and accumulate in the body. The other thing is that the vitamin E tends to be deficient in people with iron issues and blood issues. So getting a high quality vitamin E is gonna be important and consuming more copper rich foods to balance the iron in the body and improve the integrity of the red blood cell amongst many other beneficial effects like the cellular utilization or consumption of oxygen. So I would definitely recommend looking into taking KSM 66 ashwagandha for the thyroid, doing some things to lower estrogen as we talk about in various videos on the YouTube channel and as we talk about in depth in both our Forever Healthy Hair course and our Healthy Weight Loss course. And then in regards to vitamin E, you're just gonna wanna make sure you're getting a full spectrum vitamin E, ideally from the tocopherol, not the tocotrienol. Also keep in mind that high quality pastured egg yolks and beef liver are good sources of vitamin E. So is cacao butter. And then from there, copper rich food. So that's your shellfish. I'd recommend consuming some shrimp or oysters at least two times a week to get the copper and selenium that you need for good thyroid function and for regulating the iron in your body. But for more tips beyond this video, definitely watch the video I put up on my personal YouTube channel that talks all about iron and what you can do to correct toxic levels of iron in the body. All right, guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. If you've enjoyed it and found it helpful, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you're interested in learning more beyond this video, keep in mind that we have a blog that is full of free information. We have an online wellness academy with a couple of really great courses for improving various areas of your health. And also, if you're interested in supplementing with any of the herbs that I recommended throughout this video, be sure to check out our online tonic herb shop. All of these things you can find in the description box below.